Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here with us today or joining us online. Um, my name is Michael Waymeyer, and I'm chair of the Department of Special Education. And I wish I had written my notes in a larger font. Um, I am uh, honored to welcome you to uh, this long anticipated event, uh, the 2022 Mayan lecture uh, delivered by Commissioner Joan McLaughlin. I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, Dr. McLaughlin in a moment, but there are some thank yous I would like to make first. Um, the Edward L. Mayan Distinguished, Distinguished Lecture is organized every other year by the KU Department of Special Education. Uh, the Mayan Lecture Series addresses cutting edge issues that impact people with disabilities, including education, families, research, and instructional resources. Endowed by Stan and Marianne Love of the Love Publishing Company, this lecture series honors the enduring legacy of uh, uh, Professor Edward L. Mayan, who provided leadership for learning and innovation throughout his career at the University of Kansas. And of course, we are pleased to have Ed and Marie here with us tonight. So stand up, raise your hand. Throw money, do something, yeah. Um, Ed, who is now Professor Emeritus, uh, served as Chair of the Department of Special Education, Dean of the School of Education, and as Executive Vice Chancellor for the Lawrence Campus. Um, and we are, are grateful to Stan and Marianne Love for uh, the opportunity to host this event. Some of you will recall that our previous Mayan lecture was delivered by uh, Professor Phil Ferguson in March of 2018. In the fall of 2019, the department's uh, Knowledge Mobilization Committee, chaired at that time by Dr. Sean Smith, began to prepare for the next every other year Mayan lecture. Uh, the faculty was enthusiastic about the committee's recommendation that Dr. Joan McLaughlin uh, should deliver the 2020 Mayan Distinguished Lecture and she was scheduled to present the, that lecture on April 29th, 2020. Of course, we all know what happened, don't we? <laughs> so over the past two years, the co-chairs of uh, Knowledge Mobilization Committee, Drs. Jim Thompson and Deb Griswold, kept in touch with Dr. McLaughlin to try to find a, a time that she could travel safely to Lawrence and, and be with us. And, so four years after uh, the last Mayan Distinguished Lecture, that time has finally arrived. Um, a final thank you to Shauna Price, who uh, had to plan this event, not once, but in fact, twice. We were, we were keyed up and ready to go. <laughs> so so uh, double duty on this one. The department is fortunate to have Shauna in the role as department manager and to uh, as the point person for uh, events like, like this and like the Mayan lecture. And now for our distinguished lecturer, um, I know many of you know, I'm not going to go to, through the entirety of her CV, but uh, uh, Joan is the commissioner uh, of the Institute of uh, Education Sciences National Center for Special Education Research, taking that role in 2013. As commissioner at Nixer, uh, Dr. McAuliffe has uh, strengthened the center's research grant and research training activities and efforts to disseminate the results of funded projects. Uh, she initiated new competitions in special education and shepherded the special education research enterprise during the tumultuous time of the pandemic. Uh, those of us who are PIs and have been PIs on, uh, on IES grants and have worked with uh, Dr. McLaughlin know how fortunate we have been to have her uh, at the helm over the past uh, several years. 
and somehow in the midst of it all, despite all the demands brought about by her leadership at Nixer, uh, Joan still manages to be the warm, welcoming, and reassuring voice uh, for Nixer in our field. So we are greatly honored to finally welcome Joan McLaughlin uh, to deliver the 2022 Mayan Lecture. So. Oh, thank you. I put that over there for you, you right? All right. Oh, wow. That doesn't. I think they can hear me in uh, Virginia. Thanks so much, Mike. And um, it really has been. It, it, this isn't too loud. No. Okay. Uh, this really has been a terrific experience for me. It's just been fun uh, from uh, my arrival in the airport um, and being personally escorted. Uh, to the, to Juniper Gardens and spending time with them, and then today through all my meetings. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, so um, I was going to talk about my journey here, um, uh, starting in tw uh, in 2020, um, and it has taken that long. And I, when I was preparing my talk, I was saying, "Geez, you know, one of the reasons I didn't go was because of the plane flights, because of course it was all so dangerous then." And I was thinking, I probably could have walked back and forth several times uh, in that period of time. Um, the other consequence is that uh, Shauna and I have become besties over this period of time. You know, she was my COVID bud, would check in, you know, how are you feeling? Uh, not so good, Shauna. I mean, just about coming, not so good. And she says, well, we're not feeling good about having you yet, you know. So anyway, it's, it's been good. And thanks so much, Shauna. Um, I think if you're here, you uh, know about the work of the National Center for Special Education Research. Um, with, but if you don't, it's one of the four centers within the Institute of Education Sciences. And in my unbiased opinion, uh, Nixer has helped to transform special ed research and practice by funding relevant and rigorous research and our research training programs. Uh, they're aimed at improving outcomes from infancy uh, through transition to high school. And more recently, we've also uh, gotten the AOK -okay to go ahead and look uh, at student, students with disabilities through POSEC. So we're very excited about continuing uh, this look along the continuum of life. This is a monumental time for IES as we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Uh, the official anniversary is November 3rd, uh, but we're rolling out some activities for about a three and a half month period. Um, so stay tuned uh, for updates on what those would be and what you'll be. We're hoping to uh, get um, activities for you know, uh, speaker series, et cetera, for, for many interests. So stay tuned. Um, I should also note that Nixer came to IES in uh, July of 2005. And so it really hasn't been our 20th year, but I know you all understand in special education, we're always up for a party. And so we'll celebrate whenever. Okay, um, I'm gonna see if I can advance slides. And um, Sean is my, whoops, wrong way. Sean is my wing person. So if I don't, I can't manage the technology, she's gonna come and rescue me. So it's great to be here to continue the, to celebrate Ed Mayan and his commitment to the university and his efforts to advance instructional methods, including his work in online learning um, and his contributions to improving practice for students with disabilities. And I had, I had a privilege of having breakfast with Ed this morning. And I just, my private message to you is that Dick Shifo Bush would have said that you've done very well.
So I'm also honored to speak to you today at the institution that has done so much for special education research. Starting in 2006 with an award to Diane Loeb, studying a vocabulary intervention for language impaired students to the most recent early career award to Katie Zimmerman that was that's aimed at engaging elementary that's aimed at um, engaging elementary school students with challenging behavior the important work that this university has done for uh, the special education community is really astounding the University of Kansas and IES have had a long productive relationship. 15 years ago, the founder of IES, Dr. Russ Whitehurst, came and gave the inaugural address um, at the Ed Mayan uh, lecture series. So, um, how am I doing so far? <laughs> uh, so in, his, in the intro, Don introduced Russ. And his intro, um, Don said that Russ had created a new standard for education research and rigor. And he had the courage to fight off the criticisms of those who sought to bring about a cultural change. He also talked about, quote, the steadfast insistence on an apolitical approach, end quote, that Russ had to research. And um, that had given him the praise and respect of many of his critics. And for me, these two features as a standard setter and as an independent and nonpartisan science agency continue to be critical for fostering the education science. So um, I went, I actually, I, I asked Shauna and I asked people on the IASM, could you find me Russ Whitehurst's talk? And he didn't have the, the paper copy and I understand why, it's because he didn't, he didn't use notes at all. Um, and what a tough act to follow. Oh, gee, dear God. So that, that really threw me off my game. Um, but then um, I got, uh, Shauna sent me the YouTube video. So I watched them and I thought I would share with some of the points that were made early on. So the first thing is that, um, the, then this was 15 years ago. So the role of federal government in advancing science is based in the constitution. Now, maybe some of you, I know some of you here, Ed and Marie were here, um, and, and you, and, and Sean, Sean, you were here, and uh, um, you now know this, but I didn't know that. So I went back, and sure enough, in Section 8 of the Constitution, it lays out the powers of Congress, and uh, Congress has the pow such powers to establish a Navy, coin money, establish the post office, and promote the progress of science. So um, uh, great foresight on our, our uh, ancestors. Yeah, really great. So the other thing that Russ had mentioned was that NIH has 40% of its budget devoted to research. And this, it, it, this was um, the numbers I'm about to say are from Russ's talk. He said for the US Department of Education, it's less than 1%. So even at that time, IES was 1% of the full um, Department of Ed budget. So I didn't bother to recalculate NIH's budget because I'm not sure I could given uh, how they've grown. But the proportion of IES to the overall department budget is still the same. And I think that's incredibly notable. And then of course, I couldn't help myself. But I said, okay, what proportion is, is Nixer's budget of OSERS, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services budget? Um, well, actually, what I did was I didn't do OSERS, I did OSEP. So specifically the Office of Special Education program. And it's less than half a percent. Which, um, you know, think about that. Um, and, you know, there are other parts of IES that do work with students with disabilities, like in the National Center for Education Statistics. They are collecting data on students with disabilities, and there are other pockets within. So just so you're clear, I didn't capture everything, but I thought it was really telling how small, how, the great work that the uh, OSEP does, and yet how small the research budget, budget is. Russ also talked about the low supply and low demand for education research. 
And this is one place where I think this is absolutely no longer true. The focus on evidence uh, has risen dramatically since 2007, and the call for evidence base uh, for practices is everywhere. So we've made a lot of progress on that front, and that's all for the good, I think. Russ also forecasted that the IES training programs would change the training and the capacity in the field. And I think this is spot on. Uh, and I'll talk about um, some of our, our training programs later on in my talk. Russ also talked about um, the, um, what IES tried to do is to provide some stability and predictability in the field. From his perspective, it was having RFAs that, that promised long-term programs of research, as well as having a peer review process that one could um, follow and, and, and um, uh, understand the process. And I think we have had success in this area uh, with our standing programs of research and our training programs and the high, highly standardized peer review process. The exception to this, I think, is funding uncertainty. Without funding, certainly, without funding certainty, we can't be as predictable and it limits what we can do. So the vision that Russ laid out for us uh, at IES and what we have gone on to accomplish at the, in the 20 years of um, IES is worth celebrating. I'll focus on those accomplishments today. Um, I also want to acknowledge that IES isn't the only game in this town or in Washington, that there are others that focus on individuals with disability, uh, government agencies like NSF and NIH, and, and um, as well as private philanthropies. But um, I will stick with what I know best, uh, which is Nixer, and uh, in the, my remaining marks, remarks today. Okay. Uh, so I thought I would start off, uh, off with um, talking about uh, the objectives uh, that, that are related to our mission. And this is true for both of the research centers. Um, we seek to develop or identify education interventions. And by that, we're speaking broadly about practices, programs, policies, and uh, approaches that enhance education outcomes and can be widely uh, employed. We seek to identify what works and importantly, what doesn't work um, and thereby encourage innovation and further research. We try to understand the processes that underlie uh, the effectiveness of education interventions and the variation in effectiveness. And we seek to develop measures to assess education outcomes and progress. Okay. Um, I'm going to present evidence of what I consider successes that we have had in special education research. But I'd start, thought I'd start by acknowledging uh, Nixer research at the University of Kansas. I don't think any of this will surprise any of you, but maybe different kinds of tables or some such thing. All right, the first thing is that KU is among the top three institutions, both in the number of um, awards in our main research competition, as well as um, in the research training programs. And you can see your competitions up there. And, you know, they're at your heels. So, uh, you know, you, you uh, may have to step up your game a little bit. Uh, okay. Um, and then in terms of our main competition, uh, our special education research grants, um, uh, about half of the projects awarded to KU teams have been to develop and test interventions with significant work done in efficacy testing and measurement and a couple of exploration studies. And I know that uh, um, replication, I put replication up here and it says zero, but I know that some of you are, are trying in this realm and hopefully successful soon. In terms of uh, the um, areas of focus, uh, the preponderance of the work is an early intervention and early childhood. Um, uh, clap hands for the Juniper Gardens folks. Uh, the social, emotional, and behavioral area, and the um, transition uh, from secondary school, and then uh, a few other projects as well. And then um, Kansas researchers have been funded through just about every award mechanism that we've stood up. 
Um, I think there might be one that you haven't uh, gotten, maybe the NAEP process data um, competition. But other than that, I think you've been represented. So uh, your contributions to the uh, pressing needs of the field have been great. Okay, now I'm going to talk about our successes, and I'm going to start with um, evidence building and what we uh, have accomplished uh, since our award, starting our awards in 2006. And I'm going to start with causal studies. Um, so Nixer has funded 156 causal studies that includes efficacy, effectiveness, and, and follow-up studies across competitions. And 96 have been completed to date, and 89 of these have had publications. And I, when I say 89 of uh, the 96 have publications, this means to date. We have not given up on uh, these folks. They're still working on their analyses and writing it up, and, and uh, we will uh, not let them go without some, some good work uh, presented in the field. And 40, and, and it sounds like some of you believe me, and it's true. Uh, 40, 49 have been reviewed by the What Works Clearinghouse, and 39 of those reviewed by the What Works Clearinghouse have met standards. I want to say that there are 17 additional um, causal impact studies waiting in the wings for the WWC review. Just because of their workflow, we can only get through so many uh, uh, projects, but we have 17 waiting in, in review. Okay, why does it matter? It matters a lot to have scientific evidence that backs up our recommendations for how to improve education outcomes for students. And I, I've actually um, seen evidence of that um, yesterday when um, the mayor and his staff were at our meeting and they were talking about the differences they saw in schools. Um, it matters that we are bringing science um, into practice. And examples of that um, that I have here are the practice guides that are being developed by the What Works Clearinghouse uh, and more recent ones in math and reading. We have stronger evidence than ever before. When the panels used to meet, they used to, if they didn't have strong evidence, they would go with expert advice or um, where the experts thought people, what practices they thought people should use. But more recently, we have a lot more evidence to back this up. And all six of the recommendations that were made in the math practice guide had strong evidence. And for the reading practice guides, three of the four recommendations had strong evidence and the other had moderate evidence. The math practice guide has had over 2,500 downloads and over 17,000 page reviews. And the reading practice guide has had over 8,000 downloads and just under 60,000 page views. And this doesn't include those who have reached out via ERIC. The WWC also puts out evaluations of evidence on specific interventions, um, as well as um, reviews of single studies with the goal of helping to identify well-designed studies, trustworthy research, and meaningful findings to inform decisions and improve education outcomes. And, uh, uh, the two research centers funded a survey of over 500 uh, teachers uh, at the end of last year. And it was part of an effort to help us think about dissemination. We talked a lot about um, getting research out to teachers and practitioners that need to use it. And so we, we did this survey about what teachers thought were important and how could we, we um, share the evidence. And, even though I know, and some of you have talked to about this morning, that teachers are you know, going to Pinterest, they're using people within the schools and whatever, we did find evidence that um, a number of teachers were using IES as a resource. Um, and shocking, uh, not well, surprising because um, I, I didn't expect the, the numbers that we got, but um, I understood it was, even, even more special ed teachers than general ed teachers are looking for advice and evidence from IES. Um, and and uh, this, this I thought was, was, uh, was reason for us all to keep going. Okay, um, I wanna talk to you about um, the other types of work that we fund. 
So Nixer has fund, funded 226 grants for development work across all our competitions. Uh, the largest percentage of our grant awards goes towards development work. And that's often a surprise to a lot of people. They think, oh, um, IES does uh, randomized controlled trials, efficacy studies, but we actually fund more development work. And um, the projects themselves, they not only support the development, but importantly, they fund the pilot testing or new or, or modified interventions with the goal of having a fully developed intervention at the end of uh, uh, the, um, the grant uh, with promise for an efficacy trial uh, so that they can go forward and move the pipeline along. So 161 of these grants have been completed to date and 142 have publications. About two thirds of these with publications have shown promise. And, uh, and, and the promise is for providing beneficial outcomes for students with disabilities. I think that's a pretty good hit rate. Um, when you think of all of science, um, you, you don't get that, um, uh, that good uh, uh, hit rate. And you, you, you always need to go into it knowing that you're gonna be funding a lot of things that just don't work. So I think, I think we've got a good thing going here. I also wanna note that even if there isn't promise, it's not that we just toss aside the work that's been done. Oftentimes, and many of you may be part of this world where it didn't work in the development grant. So you go back and you say, okay, what's wrong? Is it my theoretical model? Is it not intensive enough? Didn't I, did I not provide enough uh, of, of instru instruction for the teachers to be able to implement this? And so it really isn't a loss. It's a, it's a, a, a teachable moment. Okay, and why does development work? Um, so, um, totally lost my pace. Oh, here we go. So, um, you know, we fund these development projects because they have been rated highly by peer review panels. They're, they are, to, they need to be significant for the field and they need to show why they're worthy of this investment. What are they taking the place of? Or what are they gonna do that's different and needed? And all of these have been rated highly. You know how difficult it is to get a grant. So we know we're on the right track with them. It's also a place where innovation takes place. Um, and um, we need to foster that in our work. And it's also key to the research pipeline that allows further testing of programs later on. But of course, science isn't linear and we see all kinds of, the pipeline is, you know, has pipes going all over the place. So we see the pipeline going from development work to measurement because they've decided they need better measures or they need to go back to ex exploration research because they need to understand the phenomenon better or it goes to efficacy. So, so there are all ways that science, science can work. Okay, now, um, why does it matter? Um, did I lose my place? No. Um, yeah, okay. Um, exploration. Nixer has 70 exploration studies. 30 of these have been completed to date and 31 have had publication. I love exploration studies, um, and I, I think they matter a lot. I think it helps to guide the field. Um, so, for example, I've talked about this with some groups I've talked to today. We've funded um, some uh, work to analyze process data from the NAEP assessment. Um, it's the first time where all the accommodations have been on the laptops that were used to assess students in, in, in NAEP. We know what accommodations the students get. We know whether they use them or not. We know with the, whether or not they get the right outcomes. We know their patterns of going through, uh, uh, through the test and, so, uh, and whether they have extra time and all of those things. And so um, uh, by analyzing the data, we know what accommodations we use and are helpful. We know what universal design uh, and, and uh, um, uh, what the universal design uh, outcome is. And so given the increasing reliance on online testing um, and assessments, 
it gives us a view of, uh, of working with students with disabilities that we haven't had before. So it, it really is a, a great program and I'm excited to find out more about what, what's, um, what they find. Um, and then we've also um, funded a lot of analyses of the large database the, uh, or many databases, the National Longitudinal Transition Studies. And for those of you who work in this area, you know that that helped us gear up for some very serious uh, and rigorous work um, in the transition space. Exploratory work also helps us flesh out theoretical models. Um, you know, it, it really is this way that we go back and say, well, I think we had that wrong, or I think we need to add these moderators or think about this. So it's incredibly useful that way. And, um, in, and um, within the research centers, we also fund uh, meta-analyses under exploration. And we have several ongoing and completed meta-analyses projects on a variety of topics, including treatment in intensity for effective communication for those with ASD and complex communication needs, as well as intervention practices associated with um, outcomes for students with ADHD. And for the one with ADHD, this was a comprehensive meta-analysis because there have been so many along the way. So, you know, we're really trying to use science and, and, uh, and uh, get more bang for our buck. Okay, and measures. Um, Nixer has funded over 70 um, projects focused on the development and validation of measures for students with disabilities. 48 of these have been completed and 45 of these have publications. Um, and why does it matter? Uh, there's an incredible need for measures to address uh, the issues facing students with disabilities, both in research and practice. Um, I don't think I've ever been to a topic focused meeting when someone hasn't talked about the need for better measures. And I, you know, I, I see head nods and it's true. I mean, it, 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 we, we just aren't there. We need we need new measures for students with disabilities, and we need information about existing measures to validate them for our, um, students with disabilities. Okay, I'm gonna just stop for a sip of water. And those I went to lunch with, I probably ordered something that made me too thirsty. Okay. So, um, we talked about evidence building, and I'd like to talk about just building the infrastructure. So when Russ talked about standard setting, um, I thought of a few things. Um, so we have developed standards for the field, including the What Works Clearinghouse standards, and they just came out with version 5.0. I think I joined IES around version 2.0. Um, and certainly was aware of those before, but um, they have evolved over time as the field has changed and demanded more of uh, the What Works Clearinghouse and asked really good questions of the What Works Clearinghouse. Like, why do you do this rather than this? And so um, uh, those have evolved. Um, I, um, I am happy to report that the single case design standards are no longer pilot standards. Um, I think we have a ways to go. I don't think single case design researchers are totally happy with it, but you know um, we're making incremental uh, progress in that direction. And because um, the single case design researchers have continued to nudge the What Works Clearinghouse, I think we will continue to make progress and make um, uh, uh, compromises so that in the end, I think we will all be happy with it. But, um, you know, let's, let's all celebrate that they're not pilot anymore. Um, we have also developed common guidelines with the National Science Foundation for the types of research that I've talked through, um, including exploratory development and, and causal impact studies. And that's important because you want agencies that um, fund similar kind of work to be on the same page. Um, and uh, more recently, we added guidelines to replication as um, we realized that was also an important uh, a, a set of standards for us to talk about. Um, and Mark Schneider, the current director of IES, developed the SEER principles. Um, he often says that we won the battle on RCTs, um, but there's much more that we need to do to make research transparent, actionable, and focused on 
uh, meaningful outcomes. And um, when we started this process, I mean, he, he came up with the SEER principles um, fairly easily and then you know, vetted them and we talked about them. But at the time, it was, we, we call them principles rather than standards because we didn't think that they were ready for prime time. We wanted the field to get to know them. We wanted feedback from the field. Um, and, and I think, you know, you all, um, oops, I'll put up the SEER principle. Um, you would all um, agree that they're important, um, but many things weren't ready. And some, some, you know, these are applicable mostly to causal impact studies. They, they relate to some other projects as well, but, you know, sometimes they're, they're not um, relevant. Uh, for a particular thing. So, um, so we're still building them. They're still evolving. And I like the idea of being in a place where things can evolve because we, we've seen so many changes and needs emerge from the field. So I think we did a, um, we, we rushed through, I mean, for Mark, having people do cost analyses of interventions was really important because he said, you know, when you're when you're selling these things to school districts, they're going to be really interested in how much this costs, and they want to going to want to compare. So um, he had us, you know, um, work very hard to get up some resources, and we went from encouraging uh, cost analyses in our impact studies to requiring them, and then encouraging them in any other projects that made sense. And we now have resources. We've done training in that. And that's how we see um, these other projects going, uh, uh, SEER principles going as well. Um, you know, we have, we make recommendations, we make, we encourage, then we make recommendations, and um, then we require uh, folks to do things. Some of them are going to take a long time. I particularly am um, finding it really hard, the core components, not that that's not important, but how do we have researchers do that systematically in their work, especially given the amount of money that we give up for grants. We give a lot of money, but if you're gonna to wanna to get into code components, it's gonna take a lot more. So, um, you know, still a ways to go. And, um, and this too is evolving. We added equity. Um, that was our last one, it's the third one down. Um, uh, as, as we were being reflective on, you know, what we needed to be asking of ourselves and um, our researchers. Um, okay. So now I want to talk about our investment and research methods. So um, IES created a research methods competition. It's housed in NCER, but of course, um, uh, methodologists of all stripes are welcome to apply there. And many single case design folks have. So, um, you know, they're uh, equal opportunity in methods. Um, and this, this project, is uh, the program is designed to further our understanding of the best methodologies and statistical practices in the education sciences. It also has an early career component for early career methodologists, which has been important. And to date, 102 projects have been supported under this program. Um, and um, both NCER and NICSER have invested in preparing methodological resources to support high quality research. And examples of the two research centers uh, documents um, uh, include those on RCT, single case design, power analyses, et cetera. And if you get the slides, these are all live linked if you're interested in any of them. And I'd like to talk about the um, research training program first in NCER. Um, uh, because I, I think they, um, they have made, uh, they have done tremendous things in their programs. Um, they have uh, programs that focus on undergraduates uh, considering careers in the education sciences um, and, you know, trying to really um, foster that love of the education sciences early. Uh, they fund uh, pre- and postdoctoral training and methods training for current research scientists. They also started the Pathways Training Program, which are grants awarded to minority-serving institutions and their partners that create research training program opportunities that are like eight weeks to a year long uh, that prepare uh, fellows for doctoral studies. And these are undergraduates all the way up through master's program. 
Um, and methods training in NCER, um, they again have been very inclusive uh, in, in inviting everyone to workshops and summer institutes. And um, my colleague, Tom Brock, the former commissioner of um, NCER got back from one and he was really excited. And he said that there were more people there who were special ed researchers than researchers that would come to him for funding. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, and, and um, you know, colleagues of mine have told me they, like one of my colleagues who now works at NSF uh, said that, um, you know, he came in as a program officer at this level and after the RCT training, he was at this level. So they're really worthwhile and, and uh, really they build a community. Um, and they, they, they're, doing, um, they're doing RCTs, QEDs um, as well, but they're also doing a lot of other interesting training. Like uh, two days ago, there was a news flash that came out that said that this summer they're going to be offering one in implementation science. It's going to be in June of uh, 2023. And um, uh, they, um, I, I think applications are due in December and it, it will be um, uh, 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 in Seattle. So um, great place to, to spend some time. Um, they also do cost of analysis and cost effectiveness and meta-analyses. So um, for Nixer, we have uh, included early career and we have you know, a great example of an early career awardee here. Um, uh, and and you know, the important component of this for me is not only giving early career folks a chance to do research, but also the mentorship that's involved. And I think that um, some of you have taken that on and, and, that, and Kathleen is right in front of me. So I'll give you a nod and for, for that. Um, and uh, for our, I, and we have done postdoc as well. And I know Judy in particular is, is uh, has been interested and, and Juniper Gardens has, has done really well with that program. Um, and uh, for our training in education research, um, we have focused, you know, we're the, the poor cousins. Uh, so we could foc only focus on uh, a couple of training programs, and we focused on ones that we felt were important for uh, special education. So single case design, uh, we've been funding that uh, for a number of years now. And also um, uh, uh, smart designs, that's what I would say um, in, in uh, my hometown. Um, but you know, now that I'm a sophisticated smart design, um, and this is uh, uh, the multi-stage experimental designs that can help education researchers develop and evaluate high quality adaptive interventions. And of course, adaptive interventions are important because in special education, sometimes you need to change up the intervention as time goes on. All right, so, um, we have an incredible need for measures um, for, um, oh man, did I get a little messed up here? Yeah, sorry, here we go. Hmm. Yeah, I know it's going to be. Oh, here we are. Oh, is that on the wrong page? Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you about my life story. <laughs> um, so, so uh, what I'd like to do is to tell you the outcomes for our training programs, um, and uh, we actually uh, NCER and Nixer, we have. Um, we have funded a contract to help us follow our training fellows and early career folks um, uh, that will focus on, you know, what happened afterwards, what were their experience, what, it, what were their uh, contributions to the field, including publications, et cetera. So that's in the works. So all I can do now is I can just talk to you a little bit about the numbers that we've had. So let me start with post-secondary. So since 2008, uh, Nixer has awarded 
20 postdoc grants to 13 institutions. KU has had four. Um, 79 fellows have graduated from these programs and gone on to work as faculty or research scientists in co at colleges and universities. And the programs have focused on a wide array of things that really need a focus, which is autism, social and behavioral strategies, early intervention, reading, um, educators and other service providers, and system level interventions such as MTSS. So for our early career grants, uh, since 2013, uh, we have made 33 grants to 28 institutions for 33 early career investigators. Six of these folks, even though it only started in 2013, six of these are now PIs or co-PIs on other Nixer competitions. And in our methods training, as I've already said, um, since 2016, we've funded uh, two, two grants um, for um, uh, our, our smart, smart designs and um, our, our uh, single case design. Um, and uh, and uh, funded uh, just you know hundreds hundreds have attended these workshops, so it's really making a difference. And I think in single case design, I particularly notice it because there are more people that are available for our peer review panels, and there's more um, conversations where you know people understand the methods and understand the various ways that one could do single case design. So all that is exciting. All right, one doesn't talk about infrastructure at IES without talking about um, scientific peer review. And of course, um, I, uh, I have a, um, a healthy distance from the peer review, so um, and I don't want to jeopardize that, so I'll, I'll limit my comments. But it's been a critical part of the infrastructure. Um, our peer review is handled by the IES Office of Science, which is separate from the research centers uh, that run the grand competitions. And this firewall, is intended to allow for the peer review process that is object, as objective as possible and, and frees the program offices to provide technical assistance. Um, what's, what people probably don't know is that we have a national board of education sciences that advises the director. And in the legislation, it's laid out that the board needs to approve the peer review process and procedures. And so the, the procedures that we use have been approved by the board. Um, we haven't had a board in a number of years now. I think November of 2016 was the last time. Um, we can have uh, conversations about that um, after. Um, uh, but uh, um, so we, uh, whenever we tweak the peer review process, it has to go through the board. Um, but anyway, um, uh, on the slide, I've included a link to um, learn more about the process at IES. And also uh, the last link is to encourage you to um, uh, volunteer to be a peer reviewer. And I've talked a lot about this to early career folks and to the uh, doc and postdoc students when they're ready to go in and sign up because um, I think we're really trying to get diversity of you know, senior people and uh, new people to sort of bring them up in the ranks of uh, review. And it's just an incredibly valuable exercise uh, for you to be part of, uh, to you know, understand how the research is discussed and, and what matters to the peer reviewers and how they follow what they read in the RFAs. Okay, I thought I would just um, talk to you a little bit about uh, COVID's impact. Uh, but before um, we get into what we have done um, I thought I would um, start out with a, a question. So I'm going to go through the responses and have you raise your hand. I think raise your hand if you think COVID-19 will still affect special education out learning outcomes for the next amount of time. So how many do you think that COVID-19 will affect outcomes for six months? How many for a year? How many for five years? 10? How many for the rest of these students' lives? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And, and that's, it's pretty daunting. And so if you're sitting in the front, you know that most people think they're gonna be around for a very long time. Um, and uh, 
So um, with that charge, uh, we um, were happy uh, to help um, take some of the American rescue plan funding and put it to good use for research. So uh, we did a, a few things um, for um, the pandemic recovery work. Um, IES got a hundred million uh, from pandemic recovery. And uh, some of it went to find out what was happening in schools, the school pulse survey, you know, you know asking things like, are you, are you virtual? Are you, you know, closed down, you know, really early on and finding out what the health and safety measures were. And, and it's gotten, you know, a little better, um, you know, trying to get some questions in about special ed and what about teacher shortages in special ed? What about services, those kinds of things. Um, and then um, a lot of it has gone to research and um, director um, Schneider has been uh, very understanding that disproportionately students with disabilities have been affected. So uh, we have gotten uh, some opportunities to use that uh, money in, in great ways. So one of the things that we did was we funded, uh, uh, we invested 20 million in research funding through our special competition for um, a pandemic recovery. And the awards were made um, and they cover uh, a great, uh, you know, many things that are, are important, uh, math, reading, writing. Um, uh, Kathleen, you can imagine what she's focused on. She got a, a grant. Um, accelerating autism screening and diagnoses for students with disabilities. Uh, this one was, uh, I, I like this one a lot because the wait list had grown tremendously during COVID and um, they're using um, some online screening to sort of help uh, assess students and, and get them uh, where they need to be, and then language development. And all of these projects have an emphasis of, on supporting teachers, uh, school teams, early interventionists, and parents in their work as appropriate in, in COVID. Okay, um, so we have also done a couple of other uh, things that have been a little bit more creative uh, for Nixer and sort of have stretched us uh, in, in some ways. We're collaborating with the National Science Foundation to fund an artificial intelligence institute to address pandemic recovery for students with disabilities. Um, the review panel has met, and this was open to a broader way, a, array of ideas for AI and a broader way, array of problems that could be addressed for students with disabilities across a variety of ages. ages. And um, the review panel has met. Um, I, I, I sat in on the review panel. I was very concerned because, you know, the benefit of it was that you'd bring the technology and the AI expertise of National Foundation staff and their grantees, along with the well-grounded people that are in IES and our researchers. And hopefully, you know, you get a great mix. And uh, I was really, you know, uh, very nervous about it. But um, I think, I think the the NSF folks really adopted. I, I could hear in their questions and the language that they were using that it was really important to get the the results on the ground. You know, like not just to have it up here, but it really needed to be useful to people soon. And they they talk about um, use inspired research at NSF, mean, which means that someday it's gonna be useful. And what we were trying to say is, no, it needs to be useful now. Um, and so, um, so we went through the review process and we have a winner. And um, I think it, um, if you follow through and hear about it, I think you'll agree with me that this is an area where we, we desperately need some innovation. We're also doing two learning acceleration challenges. And Mark Schneider loves prizes. He loves the X prize and, um, he, it, it's been his thing. So he's really encouraged us to uh, go down the road of some learning acceleration challenges. Um, and um, for us, um, these are um, prize competitions with two phases. And the first phase is the implementation plan. And that was due on September 30th. And then the second phase is for implementation. And so right now we're in, we're, we've just had the, the judges meet and uh, discuss uh, the, the, uh, the uh, um, submissions. And um, uh, we, we will be, within the next couple of weeks, we will be telling 
those phase one winners um, that they are set to go on and that they'll start in November and they'll implement their, their plan uh, through April of next year. And then they'll award um, even um, a higher amount of money. They get $25,000 for winning this first round. Uh, and and uh, one focus will be on math uh, for kids with disabilities. And in particular, it's focusing on digital intervention for students so that, that, uh, that we can um, you know, take advantage of uh, some, uh, some uh, needed expertise that didn't particularly need the teacher, which you know, are, are especially in this era of short shortages, um, we really need something like that. And then uh, a focus on middle school science. And this one isn't focused on uh, students with disabilities, but they were encouraged to apply and so could also be um, in, within um, this uh, challenge. Okay. All right, now I'm gonna talk about um, areas of opportunity. Um, this is where I think we need to continue to do some work. And I had a laundry list and my, um, Nixer, my folks at Nixer helped me to uh, pare those down to five. Um, but I will say in my conversations today, um, I, uh, uh, and, and last night at dinner, um, I, um, you know, I, I heard resonate other ones like, you know, I think we have a replication need and I think we have a follow-up need. We really need to follow up to see if our interventions are sustainable. So those are on my list. I'm not gonna mention them anymore here, but you know, you know, come talk to me. Uh, Carrie and I were, were just chatting about that last night. Um, okay. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about um, is um, diversity, equity, um, inclusion and accessibility. And um, we have been thinking about DEIA um, related to applicants um, and their institutions, peer reviewers, uh, as well as the research teams that, that get through our application process and get an awards and also study samples. We have a firm footing for our founding legislation, uh, which has strong language on DEIA. And that's true for ESRA, the, the legislation that founded IES. And it's certainly true for IDEA. Um, so we feel like, you know, um, uh, it's always more powerful when something that a federal agency does is rooted in their legislation. So we feel like what we do, you know, has good roots. Um, and we also have uh, developed an IES diversity statement uh, we did this a while ago, and um, we also have a diversity and inclusion council in IES, which covers the, um, which has representatives from each of the four centers within IES and the Office of Science. So in December of 2020, we held a technical working group, which is often what we do when we want outside input uh, to take some actions in a particular area. So we had a technical working group focused on DEIA and um, we had the summary up and that's the nice picture that's on the cover. And um, they made five broad recommendations for us. They want us to identify key gaps and barriers. They want us to develop an action plan. They want us to revise existing and develop new funding opportunities, uh, attend to research, the research pipeline and the ecosystem and uh, they want to, us to engage in targeted outreach. So we have made uh, some progress in each and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it, but one of the, um, one of the fun and yet daunting um, times has been uh, that we have held listening sessions and um, we wanted to leverage voices from uh, the Black, Hispanic, Native American and Alaskan Native, Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, LG, BTQI and the disability communities. And so we had listening sessions with each one of them. And um, in some, I mean, there's some really complicated issues that we have to work out. Um, and then some low hanging fruit. Like I was embarrassed to say that for the disability group, they told us that we used to publish our RFAs in Word and PDFs. And lately we've been doing it in just PDFs. I had no idea we just didn't PDFs anymore and I wasn't paying any attention, but apparently for those with low vision, the, um, the, the word file is better, you know? And, and so 
done, fixed already, you know, and so there are things like that, but there are some things that are going to take us years to, you know, sort of work out. So what else have we done? Um, we, um, we have this year principle on addressing equities in learner opportunities, resources, and outcomes. Um, we are about to hold a second technical working group, um, and this one we're going to focus on tools that our researchers can use to help with DEIA and um, their work. Um, and we also have contracted uh, with a group that's going to help us identify what other funding agencies are doing in DEIA um, in terms of um, uh, their funding opportunities and also how they, they make their resources available. Um, and then we have two surveys that are going on. And hopefully um, the first one you've all, as after you submit a grant you're aware of. So um, we, we want to survey all of our applicants so that we can track how well we're doing um, and think about next steps um, for um, ad advancing diversity and equity. And um, we were trying to, how do we, how do we get every applicant to fill it out? So we, one, one thing is when they submit the application, they have to fill it out. But the thing that you need is you can't have that demographic survey go with the application. So you have to split it out. Of course, we are the federal government. It takes us a really long time to figure out how to do that. So last year, we finally got it separated out. So we're, we're ready to go for a bore. But the problem is our response rates. People don't like to give demographic information. And, and I think particularly about disability. Um, so, so this is of the researchers. So um, I think that's, that's our challenge. Um, and yet I'm hoping that people understand why we want to use it. It'll be confidential information. It won't have a name associated with it, um, but it will be used for us to learn where we need to do better and how we can do better. So that's one thing. Then the other thing that um, some of you may have gotten is a survey about your samples if you have an IES grant. Um, because again, we're looking for support to figure out how well we are doing in um, looking at diverse samples of students. And um, so um, uh, we want to know what data you were able to collect and what, da what uh, data might be an easy reach for you to collect or ideas that you have for the kinds of information that you could collect. Okay. Um, uh, Around this topic, um, before I move on, I just, I see a real commitment from staff. And I think within the nation, there is a moment for um, improving our diversity and equity work. Um, and uh, Brian Boyd was our co-chair for our grantee meeting last year. And he, he says, is this, a, is this a, a moment or a movement? And um, as we do this, I keep thinking of, of Brian's words to try to make it not just a moment in time, but a real movement to, to make some progress along these lines. And IES staff are really committed to doing that. But we of course need your help. Um, okay, uh, and the other, the other area of opportunity I think and, and need um, is uh, on um, research on educators and school-based service providers. Uh, since 2007, we have funded 37 grants in uh, this area, um, but the need uh, has continues to be there. And then we had COVID, and now it's in, in, an incredibly important area given teacher shortages, early interventionist shortages, burnout, um, increased need for teachers who are burnt out to support the kids who are having mental health problems. Um, it's just, you know, th there's a, a, a real uh, call for, for help. And um, in particular, um, we um, are thinking that we need more work in pre-service, teacher training and career development, and a focus on paraprofessionals. I think we have one project that's focusing on paraprofessionals in our portfolio. And you know, given the amount of time they spend with students with disabilities, that's just not right. We need more of that work. And also school-based service providers, nurses, speech-language pathologists, we, we, we need this work done. And then um, uh, we need measures of teacher knowledge and practice for those in special education. Um, and and um, the, the effort to use um, uh, measures that aren't focused on students with disabilities 
has a, um, uh, the potential to do real damage because they're being rated on different things and they're not looking at the kinds of things that teachers or students with disabilities have to do. Okay, post-secondary education. Um, according to the most recent data from the National Center for Education Statistics, 19% of undergraduates reported having a disability. And uh, over 90% of public two and four year universities report enrolling students with disabilities. Um, despite all this, the outcomes are still particularly poor, even among completion. Uh, we, we, it's very hard for students with disabilities to have success. So um, post-secondary education is a new area for Nixer, although we have funded uh, zero projects to date, um, although we got a good crop in uh, this go round. And so we're very excited about that. Uh, we held a technical working group in uh, December of 2021. And what we were trying to do was to find our lane in post-secondary education. Where, where, do we, where can we do the most good? And um, in some ways it was a good meeting. In other ways, it was incredibly daunting because they were saying we need more data, we need interventions, we need exploratory work, we need capacity building. And you know, so they just ran the gamut. So we decided that we were gonna start out with having an R&D center that focused on exploratory work for students with disabilities that would, would then in post-sec, that would then help us to forge forward. And, um, uh, you know, as I said, it, 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 was, it was just a gamut of things that, that uh, we need to focus on. Okay. We also need research on systems. And I know all of you here know that. Um, since 2002, um, uh, that shouldn't be 2002, that's 2006, because we went around in 2002. Nixer has funded over 28 projects. And that's really not a lot, you know, per, per average year, that's just not a lot. Um, and th this includes um, the um, MTSS network and our research and development center, like the RTI one that Charlie and Judy had. Um, we, we, uh, while systems are important for students with disabilities and the coordination of systems are important, we just don't get that much. And I, I'm thinking it's because it's so hard to do. It's so hard and it's so hard to do within the time frame of a Nixer project because you really need to be looking um, uh, far out for, for outcome. So um, uh, we need more work. We need to you know, do some internal thinking about how we can uh, better support this work. Um, and, uh, uh, but, we, but we need to get it done because it's so important. And one particular aspect of, um, of uh, systems is the finance system for special ed. Um, and it, it, you know, I, I just think of the Watergate where Deep Throat, the Watergate movie with Deep Throat tells the reporter, follow the money. And I think for special ed, that's really true, right? You know, like where, where does the money go to? Who's getting it? What districts are getting it? Is it disproportionately given out? And so um, I, I've kind of, I, I've tried to work with NCES, the Statistics Center, to get more information from them, but they are looking at a very limited set. They're looking at funds from IDEA that go to states, but that's, that's limited. We, we really need to be looking at what states and what districts do and how they spend that money. And um, uh, in August of uh, this year, the National Center for Education, Evaluation and Regional Assistance, NCER, they funded, um, I'm sorry, yeah, um, I'm sorry, it's, it wasn't NCEE, -E, it was NCER, our, our sister center. They funded a technical working group that discussed finance matters. And it was, they didn't, it wasn't special education, but they had practitioners and researchers there. And of course, what came up, special ed, you know, you really need to focus on special ed. You really need to focus on special ed. So that was you know, a real win for us. And um, they wanted us to, um, in special ed, to focus on the range of services offered, their costs and their impact on student outcomes. Their impact on student outcomes. I'm gonna continue to harp on this because this is where I think we need to be. We, we can collect descriptive data, but then we need to go in and look at what these impacts on outcome um, are going to be. And how things differ by disability category, race and ethnicity, and SES. All right, hold on to your seats. The last study of special ed uh, spending 
was done by OSEP in the data collection year was 1999 and 2000. So we're really in need of some work here. Um, and this is where um, the National Center for Education Evaluation and Regional Assistance comes in. Uh, they are going to pick up the mantle. Uh, they um, have recently funded a task order that's going to design a study of special education spending. Um, and hopefully we'll move from there into actually conducting uh, the work. And they're also gonna do a sort of a post-mortem of the OSEP study to see what worked and what didn't work and what we could do better. So um, uh, stay tuned. And I know I talked to a postdoc this morning who was interested in special ed. I told you I had some news for you. So stay tuned. And, and if you're interested in following along, uh, write me, okay? Okay. And these are the questions that the study will answer. How much is spent on special education and related services? How did this uh, spending vary across type of school districts and students? And of course, this is, this is even before this task order is done. So these are gonna change. So you cannot hold me to these. Um, how are these uh, funds spent on educating students? Um, specifically, what share will go to instruction, personnel services, materials and products? And then of course, we all know what money goes to key services, you know, the transportation process, the due process, the out of school placements, all those are really expensive and unique to special ed. Um, and how do federal funds, particularly IDEA contribute to this? And um, my favorite is what resources would be needed to fully meet current special education needs? How about that one? We'll see how that comes out, right? Um, and, and also, um, we, we not only need the data, but we need the capacity in the field to understand this complex work. And uh, so one of the doc students was talking this morning about um, being interested in this, and I'm seeing her like in like five years ready to take this, these data and, and go for it. Um, so, and, and we, need, we really need to, to encourage this kind of work. Okay, um, and measurement. Um, you know, as I said, I have never, never gone into a meeting when, when measures weren't uh, criticized. Uh, and we need better ones and we need ones that are more focused. Um, so um, uh, we, um, we need them, you know, uh, validated for students with disabilities across a variety of contexts, including assessing, assessing knowledge, skills, and abilities, guiding instruction, improving educator practice, and assessing the systems that provide education and support systems. Now, um, uh, in the past year, um, the two research centers at IES have provided some funding to um, Ed Instruments, which is a project that's being done at a Brown University by Susanna Loeb and her colleagues. And the idea is really, a, I think, a, a laudable one. It is to develop a library of education measurements um, intended to be resources from scholars to you know, the public. And um, they're trying to build this and, and they, they've gone through, uh, they're asking the public, you can submit one. And I know the self-determination survey is there. And over the last couple of weeks, I've looked at it twice. And the first time Mike Waymeyer was the contact and the second time he wasn't. So someone is in there updating it. I guess Mike isn't um, a respected person in that area anymore to ask. Uh, so, um, my, um, so and, and my goal in providing some funding was to really get a place where people could go to see what's being used for students with disabilities, to see articles that are being done by other researchers that use this and, and for, for other researchers to contact them, right? And then um, also to get some psychometrics um, on these measures for students with disabilities. Um, much of, of this work is still to be done. Um, one, of, one of the things that I thought was, was kind of easy was that when you go onto the site, um, you, can, um, you can filter certain things, like if you want math or if you want um, uh, you know, third and fourth graders or whatever, you can, there's a filter you can use. And they don't have disability there. And so we were saying, you've got to tag it. You've got to, and, and they said, okay, we will. And it hasn't happened yet, but you know, stay tuned, stay tuned for that. Okay, now my giant wrap-up. Um, so, you know, 
that, of course, I want to um, put up a slide on IES funding. And um, I am told that this QR code is not very good on mobile apps. So Kathleen will find that it's not perfect. But I, I'm just, I'm so impressed that I can put my own phone up there and get something on there that I'm, I'm, I was, uh, you know, I didn't mind a little overlap in some of the letters. Um, but they couldn't, they couldn't fix it in time for me to come here. So I'm just uh, showing you all our, our flaws at IES. Um, so um, anyway, um, all of the uh, key things you need to know. And if I've done one thing uh, while I'm here, it's to talk up our program officers. So you can, you can um, talk to them. And then um, the IES is turning 20. And uh, you know, stay tuned because we'll be we'll be sending out notices about um, activities. And I don't I don't even know what they all are going to be yet. They're still in the works. Um, here's how to follow IES and to um, be in touch with me. And uh, my last thing um, is just to say uh, we have a lot of work to do in early intervention and special education. Um, but I I think um, uh, you know we. Uh, We've made uh, terrific progress and there's lots to celebrate and there's lots here at Kansas to celebrate. You don't even have to go outside your, your, your um, larger campus to do that. Um, and in my time that I have spent with you yesterday and today, um, I feel so heartened um, by your thoughtfulness and rigor and passion. And um, I, it, it, it's the way that you're approaching the work that you do is just really inspiring. And I appreciate that. And I, I wish you all the best. And um, I, um, I want to make sure that, uh, that uh, you find a home in Nixer or in people that you can uh, talk to about your work and that will be um, excited uh, to, to hear about what your plans are and um, what works and doesn't work and how, how you plan to, to um, help the field. Um, and I just, I want to say uh, on a personal level, it's just been wonderful to be here with you and to get to know you all um, so, so much more. And uh, just thanks for everything. Nope. We've, uh, we Put Joan through the paces the last uh, many hours. And, uh, so again, let me just say I think we'll we'll end the session. She'll be around for a few minutes, but then uh, we have to whisk her off to dinner. And uh, but I want to again say uh, thanks so very much for coming, and uh, we're so glad that it did eventually happen. Yes, yes, it yes. certainly was worth. Yeah, and I didn't have to so, walk here. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. 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 Thank you.